It's Friday, June 23rd, Centric episode where my wife Samantha has come back to join us again. Hello, Sam. Hi. We're going to talk about, as we've kind of done the last few times, we're going to talk about one show uh, that we actually just finished watching. La- what did we finish last night? Or night before? Last night. Night before? Last night. Last night. Last night. And it's a show that we mentioned, I think, when we did the first one that at some point we were going to do, and the timing worked out. So. We're now going to talk about the, what year was this on? 2016 series called The Good Place, which ran for four seasons on NBC. It's currently on Netflix. Now, the way streaming stuff is, by the time this comes out, even if it's only, even if it's just going to be a couple of weeks from now, who knows? It could evaporate because now we're in a streaming hell where you never know where anything is and stuff jumps around. So at the moment, it's on Netflix. Actually, I could tell you where it is. Hold on a minute. Because one of the few things IMDb has done that's actually benefit now, it is just Netflix, or you can rent it on Prime. So right now, you can only watch it on Netflix. So that is where you can watch it, or you can rent it in other places, I'm sure. But uh, that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. So my wife is a huge fan of this show. So I'm actually going to let her explain what it is and what it's about and everything about it. So Sam... What is The Good Place for anybody who has heard of it or never heard of it, but doesn't know anything about it? If you haven't seen this show yet and you intend to, I wouldn't listen to this until you have, because there are a lot of things that we're going to be talking about that will be spoilers. Um, Like Joe and I talked about this earlier, and he said that, you know, if by now maybe people we'll never watch it. And, you know, so it's not spoiling anything, but if you have the desire to watch it and you haven't yet, watch it first before you listen to this, because I, I totally was taken back by this show and what happens in it. Um, So I I don't want to ruin that for anybody else. Um, But the premise basically is um, there are four people that are um, died. And so they go to the good place. And um, Kristen Bell's character, Eleanor Shellstrop, um, realizes that, like, first thing, she's not supposed to be there. Um, Ted Danson plays Michael, who's, like, the head of the um, neighborhood. And I'm not trying to, like... I don't know how to run this show down without saying how it starts. So um, I'm not going to try to talk about the entire show, but um, this is how it's going to, this is how it starts. So he talks about her accomplishments and early on, she's like, Whoa, I'm, I'm not supposed to be here. Um, There she's hooked up with, she's told that um, Chidi is her soulmate and he was a professor of ethics so her plan was to maybe he can teach her how to be a better person so she belongs in the good place and she doesn't have to go to the bad place. Um, 
am I missing anything? No, I don't think so. I mean, that's the basic setup for, you know, within the first yeah. couple episodes. I think the first episode, what, did, how quickly does she tell us Chidi what? Before before the end of the first right episode, away. certainly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, like she's yeah. like, oh, hey, you're my soulmate. You'll do anything for me. Okay, oh, right. boom, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah, yeah. supposed to be yes. here. <laughs> yes. She immediately says, do you promise that you will never do anything to harm me or whatever? And he's like, oh, no, of course I promise. He's like, oh, good, because I'm not supposed to be here. And then he's kind of screwed. And yeah. Chidi's character is a professor of ethics and moral philosophy. And so the, the show has this very clever thing with him where he is at least for the majority of the show, completely trapped within his ethical morals. So if he knows he can help somebody, he must by default, not because he's being forced to by some kind of supernatural force, but by his own, way of looking at the world, he is forced to help that person pretty much no matter what, except if it comes at the expense of somebody else's happiness, I think. I think it's the only thing that, that he'll stop with. But everything else, he's basically obligated. If you come to him and say, I need your help, he basically has to help you. And that's, you know, what what ends up for the most of the first season why he's helping Eleanor, even though she is a monstrous person at times. And his character is so plagued by indecision that even the the tiniest of choices just sets him off, like gives him a stomach ache and he just can't make any choice because he's plagued by if it's the wrong choice. Yeah. So at the end, just to jump to what the big twist of the first season is, because why this will explain what the first season, you know, as we go through it is the the twist is that, in fact, because the, there's four main characters. There's Eleanor, Chidi, uh, Tahani, and Jason. And the four of them are all actually people who, through various... Eleanor's the one who's the most classically, quote-unquote, bad, in that she's rude to people, she's selfish, she actively does terrible things to her friends... So she's the classic example of a who you would expect to go to hell or whatever. The bad place is what they call it. Mm -hmm. The rest of them are. I mean, Jason is is not really. He's he's ignorantly bad. He doesn't he's really. A yeah, he doesn't <laughs> understand what he's doing. He's he's portrayed as a doofus. Uh, Chidi is. You know, his his badness is the most sort of debatable. I, 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 that the way that they explain why he's there because of his indecision, you know, I, I mean, we, it, as the show goes on, it starts getting into the idea that the way people are judged doesn't work at all. So that, that becomes a later thing in the show, but at least the way it starts out, cause none of that comes in, in the first season. His reason for being there is because he can't make a decision and it harmed everybody around him. He seems to think it's because of almond milk, which is a running gag that he thinks that the reason he's in a bad, that he's in the bad place is because he drank almond milk, even though he knew it was bad for the environment. The fact that he right. only thinks, you know, that, that he sees that as being that evil is kind of one of the, the funny quirks of the, the character. And then to Hani, uh, everything she did was essentially corrupt because it wasn't actually, cause she ran lots of fundraisers and raised lots of money for people but it was all because she essentially wanted to show up her sister who was far more famous and more loved than she was. Although you, again, as it goes on, you start to re figure out that that's because their parents were messed up. So it really wasn't the way, it, the way it's set up at first, you think her sister is a really mean and selfish person, but in fact they were both made into this by the fact that their parents were not good parents, but that's all later. Right. So essentially the first season is the, the big twist is that Ted Danson is in fact a demon and that this entire thing is an experiment because he's essentially become bored with how the bad place tortures people. And he's trying to set up a system where four people, because they're the only four humans, everybody else is a demon, and Janet, who's a essentially a robot. I mean, she's not, but she is. She's like uh, she's like a like a person of like Siri or Alexa. Yes. Like she's like a database of all knowledge. Yeah. A personified right. you say Janet and database. she just appears. Yeah. Right. And so the idea was to have these four people all torture each other for 
however long. And so the idea was to make them do it without knowing it, but to set these four people in a way that they would all torture each other. And so that's the, that was the basic premise of the first season. And then the show changes. Every season becomes a little different. But the first season is really just about ethics and different ways of looking at the world. And it's really just a way for Chidi to keep explaining all these different ways that human beings can be good or bad. And the fact that there are moral positions that are sometimes in conflict. There are classic moral questions like the trolley problem is a whole episode, which is a very famous ethical kind of dilemma. Uh, which is probably one of my favorite episodes is the trolley one. Uh, not just of season mm-hmm. one, but of the entire thing. I think that is one of the best episodes. Uh, season one is probably my favorite season. I, I honestly, I think the middle of the show, I kind of wish the show was a season shorter than it was. I realized that when we rewatched it, it's a little too long for me um, because I think the middle, it takes too long. I think that the first season and the last season are excellent. I think the middle is a little padded. I actually started to fall asleep this time watching it, which I've never done on most of our shows. I was actually kind of nodding off in season two and three. I think it just really? goes a little too far. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you like the show a little bit more than me. I have to admit. I think the show is, without a doubt, it is one of the best written shows we've ever seen in terms of a modern show. Yeah. Uh, it, it has a it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It it, ha- it knows what its ending is. It's very clear they knew exactly where they were going with it. So I think the ending is, unlike a lot of shows, when we talk about shows that go too long, this is another one that knew exactly where it was going to end. I think that's great. But I to me, the first season is very good, and the last season is very good, although I have problems with the last season, but we'll get to that. I, I actually have, I realized I have a major problem with something that happens in the last season, but maybe it's just my problem, but... Um, but the first season, I think, is a perfect season of television. I think that you would ask me, did I have any indication that the twist was going to be that they were in the bad place? None. I didn't pick up anything. Uh, I didn't I was No. The only reason I knew about it before we finished the season is I happened, I think I saw something on Twitter where somebody mentioned how great a twist it was. And that was the only reason I knew anything. But honestly, without that, I would not have known until we got to it. It's, and you, you've been listening to the podcast that they did on it. You've finished the first season you said of it, right? The first. I did. Yeah. And there's a number of things they do that are very intentional to, to hide that. And since you're listening to, I'm going to let you explain it because I think it is, again, I had no idea. Some people are going to say, Oh, I I figured it out. uh, Episode two. Well, then you're far smarter than me. I didn't figure it out. So. I didn't either. And so, yeah, this podcast that I'm listening to, they, they actually did it. Um, the character who plays Sean, um, who basically, I don't know, if, not necessarily the devil, but he runs the bad place, essentially. Um, and so he hosts it, which is so funny because he has this voice. His voice doesn't change. So when you hear it in the show, he sounds like sinister and he's evil, but then he's hosting this podcast and he's like, oh, do something good and everything is great. And it's just very funny. But so they basically take, if you're, if you like this show, if you're a fan show, I definitely recommend listening to it because they take um, every show, every episode um, is on like an episode of the show and each episode they bring on a variety of people involved in the show. It could be different writers. It's Kristen Bell. It's, you know, all the actors. It's Mike Schur who created the show, Morgan Sackett, like all of the people that were involved talk to the costume designer and they get all of these different insights and what went into the show, which I really like. I really like the, the Easter eggs and the, the technical. And then you, you learn and listening to this, how much detail and is in this i mean everything everything is thought about like there's different things that you know if they'll they'll pop up a thing on the screen really quick that um tells you how many points you earn or lose from what you did on earth i mean all of that shit is there if they had to write like a a book or a paper like 
that shit was written, not just like words on a page that don't mean anything. I mean, the writers actually like wrote stuff that nobody will ever see. It's just, I think they just had so much fun with the show. And again, I think this is what Mike Sure creates because he has this uh, in listening to the first season of the podcast, because I've already listened to it, but I, I started re-listening to it. But there were so many people involved that all they had to do was hear that it was a Mike Schur show. That's all they needed to hear. And they're like, yep, I'm in. One, a, a few people that so far, I don't know how many, but just the ones that I've listened to, like were living in New York, had an opportunity to do a Mike Schur show. And like, yep, I'll move to LA. Like, so I think that because he has such a reputation of the good stuff that he creates, um, that everybody was just in just hearing his that he was involved and nbc basically said went to him i was like you want to do a show here just do it like just gave him free license to do whatever the hell he wanted which is pretty cool if i think you know that that pulls a lot of weight and he has like a no ego, no asshole policy, best idea wins. And I think he just creates such a unique and cool environment that they just, you know, have so much fun writing and being involved in the show that, and, and the, the content that's created is just so it shows that I think. And they had a, what was the name of the ethicist? Remember the name of the guy? Um, the person who was uh, the advisor? Todd, Todd, Todd May. They, yeah. yeah, they brought in all these people. So, because he was very interested in, um, Mike Sure was very involved, uh, interested in ethics. So, like, yeah, they brought in these professors and, and you know, to, to basically, like, give the writers and them, like, you know, not like school, but kind of, because it was just, you know, they really wanted them to be, because they touch on a lot of, um, philosophy and so they really wanted them to know their shit because and like they said in the podcast anything you put out there the internet is going to destroy you in two seconds if it's not legit so they made sure like this shit holds up and they know exactly what they're talking about it probably helped that he was a uh, he was involved very heavily in the office the American version which did very well he was part of Parks and Rec, and Parks and Rec was not a big rating success, but it was very popular critically, and it had a fan base. So it makes sense that NBC would say, okay, what do you want to do? He's also involved in Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which I think yeah. just ended, or a couple of years ago, whatever it was. So it, it makes sense that they would come to him and say, we, we'll trust what you want to do. The interesting part that you had told me was that they had filmed the twist ending of season oh. one without knowing there would be a season two, which is just lunacy. Yeah. And because the, the twist of the of season one is, of course, that, you know, they're in the bad place. And so if there had been no season two, something that very frequently happens on things like Netflix and Amazon and other streaming services where they will film a first season with a cliffhanger and then decide to just shove a bowling ball up your backside and say, yeah, no, it's not going to end. Thanks. And then you're just screwed, which I've fallen for that right. multiple times. It's, you know, the fact that they did this, I, even if they didn't know they had to have an idea that they would at least be able to do some kind of movie or something. Cause otherwise that's a terrible way to leave a series. Yeah. But, or they just had oh, enough confidence, I, you know, in what they were doing. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention, I, I went off on a tangent about Mike Sure, but we started talking about it. So they knew Kristen Bell and Ted Danson. Um, he told them about the twist or first on. And then, you know, the writers obviously knew because they needed everything to be cohesive and leading up to. And they had very strict rules on like, you never see Ted Danson by himself. Um, he never wears red. I don't think anybody in The Good Place wears red. So there's all these things that you wouldn't even think about, but they didn't even want to like hint that they were in the bad place. So 
the writers knew ver a very, very um, small amount of people involved in the show actually knew the twist. So they had, you know, guest directors. The guest directors didn't know. And so they actually, like, they had almost code words for, like, what um, they talked about it with Ted Danson that he would, like, ask he would ask about like a direction, but he actually wouldn't even talk to the director. He would talk to like, you know, the executive producer or whatever, who, who knew. And, and it, I can't remember what, I can't remember what the words were, but it was something like, oh, okay, well, this is, is this good for the show? Like for the episode or like for the whole thing? I don't remember. They had like code words to like, cause you know, is this gonna, is this gonna be okay? So it can line up with the bigger picture. Um, but they had to be so secretive about everything. Um, and then they had a meeting with the four other actors um, who played Janet, Jason, Tahani, and um, Chidi. They didn't know either until I think they told them maybe like when they were, you know, episode like eight or nine and 13 was the twist or they told them like they waited to tell them. So Kristen Bell and uh, Mike sure bring them into this room and Kristen Bell was filming it. So you basically see Mike sure like you see the four of them sitting there and he's going through the twist at the end, it twist at the end of um, season one. And he tells the actors like, you know, Oh, you're actually in the bad place. They even had no idea. So they, they kept it way under wraps because they didn't want it to get ruined. And yeah, it was really cool that they did that. So yeah, first season is basically the whole setup and then the, the twist for the audience. And then season two is essentially a, there's a few episodes where Michael, uh, the demon is trying to, or the Ted Danson character is trying to, well, actually, wait a minute, before we jump to season two, they get rebooted. Off... Yeah. But before okay, we do that, let me, let's, let's yeah. pick a couple of favorite episodes from season one because let's see. I mean, we'll do it season by season. So I'm trying to look, I mean, we don't have to necessarily pick only one, but I'm trying to look through them because I mean, I, I look at season one as just like a long movie. So yeah, it's, yeah. I'm looking through. And cause it really touches in and, and gives you insight to, to all of their lives. Like, you know, each one kind of has their own where you, you realize who they are and what, what, what their life was before they died. And then you learn how they died. And, um, so first season, season that, one is a lot of setup. Is first season where basically he says, I need to take a break. He, that's where he says, I need to take a break from teaching you. I just want to go out on a boat and read poetry, right? That's season one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's my favorite episode. That's the one where Eleanor yeah. really starts to change in a very concrete way. So there's an episode because basically uh, the, that's episode right. five, I think. Oh, that's a category okay. 55 emergency doomsday. Maybe okay. that's that one where, where the, the other couple comes in. Right. Is that the same one? See, like, like I said, I just see it I all as so. one. So I don't, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention. The, the first season, the, one of the reasons I think it works so well for me is because I don't notice the episodes. They just, one to the next, I don't even notice. I mean, obviously you see the credits, you know, the show ends, it has the beginning, but I never mm -hmm. notice the episodes. They, it's just one long movie to me. And I don't, I just know the story is so good. It just keeps going. Whereas yeah. again, in season two and three, I started to notice, okay, we're, you know, we're how many episodes in, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but yes, that one is my favorite one because it's, Chidi has essentially been, because he's driven to help, he's been teaching her and teaching her and teaching her and he needs a break and she, they have this big blow up. Oh yeah. That, yeah. Because that is when the couple are there. You're right. And he says, I just want to go on a boat in the middle of the lake and, and read poetry. And, you know, and then at the end of the episode, well, not maybe the end, but later on in the episode, there's a point where Eleanor says to, you know, brings him out to a dock and there was the boat and he's got, she, she has a picnic basket, I think, and a book. And she's like, all right, go out and row your boat. And it's a selfless act. 
It's the first right. real thing that you see of Eleanor doing something for somebody else. Because we've constantly gotten flashbacks and will for most of the first two seasons, I would say. You get these frequent flashbacks, flashbacks showing Eleanor being extraordinarily selfish and mean and cruel. And this is an example where she is starting to actually think about somebody besides herself. And that, of course, is yeah. the beginning of, not the beginning of, but it's a, a very obvious sign that she is becoming a better person. So that would be my favorite of the, the first And season. she hands him a card that says she realizes that he needs some space and that she's been, you know, that this hasn't been what he wanted heaven would be like for him. So she hands him a card that says, fork off Eleanor because they can't curse there. So, and they did a really good job with, the substitutions for, you know, for curse words. And it, it's, you get the gist of what they're trying to say, but it's freaking hilarious how they curse in the show. Um, because it's, you know, anything is shirt and bench and, you know, fork. And it's just deckhead. <laughs> it's great. Very funny. Yep. Do you have any particular favorite? moments of season one um, i mean and the ending obviously is also a huge one the the last the, yes. the episode where they find out is is fantastic yeah but that's of course because right. it's that's the twist probably... being revealed so that's all, sort of automatic yeah yeah that one's really good um i i just i love this show it's hard for me to to really pick i have a lot of yeah i don't know i don't know if i have a favorite episode. okay well it's fine you don't have to have one i think i just yeah so first season ends, everybody gets reset, they all get rebooted, their memories get erased, and the first couple episodes are, uh, I think it's maybe the first two or three episodes, no, because Team Cockroach is the one where, where he basically gives up. They so the team first, up. With yeah, the first three episodes are Michael trying to hide from Sean, who's essentially his boss. Yeah, they never show you any character who was ever presented... Because they basically say that the good place is not really heaven, the bad place is not really hell, because no religion got it right. Every religion got little bits right. So there is no, there is never a god or a devil. There are just demons, and they, they never, do they actually say they're angels? I don't think they necessarily ever even no. call them angels, but no. they definitely say demons, which I find interesting. Yeah. They yeah. don't call them devils, they call them demons. So there are demons, yeah. and then there are good place people which mm -hmm. they don't have a name for, which I'm always kind of like, well, then why call them demons? But that's a, that's just more of a, I'd be curious why the, the reasoning behind that. I'm sure at some point there will be a book that comes out that explains all this stuff because I'm sure there'll be that type of thing. Uh, but anyway, that's the first few episodes of season two is Michael finally gives up and realizes, okay, uh, I, I need you guys to work with me to cover this up because if my boss finds out we're all, I'm dead, you're going to be tortured. And the way that they agree to it is they say, okay, but you have to take the ethics classes now that we're all taking. And Michael's like, well, what's the point? I'm a demon. It doesn't matter. And they're like, well, that's the deal or not. So he agrees. And then the rest of the season is essentially then Michael becoming a better person, uh, which is my favorite episodes from that are the trolley problem and the one right after, which is Janet and Michael, because I really like Janet and Michael mm -hmm. as two characters yeah. and that, you know, and then it, this, the rest kind of blurs together. Then they go to the bad place. Um, and then they get killed and put back on earth. And that's where the seat, I honestly, this time it's starting to lose me a little bit at the, at the end of two. And for some of three, I don't really know why. I, I I mean, I like the show. I love the show. I shouldn't say I like the show. I'd watch this before a hundred other things in a, in a second. But this time, the second season after Jason Manzuka shows up, because I think he's hysterical. So I'll, I'll watch him uh -huh. or anything. Um, yeah. After that, I felt like some of that stuff started to drag a little bit for me this time. I don't really know why. It just didn't seem as necessary. Maybe yeah. because I know where it's going. That's sort of the, the yeah. byproduct of yeah. it, too, is because I know where it ends Probably. up. Probably. Sure. And it's not bad because the yeah. judge shows up at the end of season two. So there's still stuff I really like. Yeah. But, yeah, some of it I'm kind of like, okay, I could probably do without a few of these episodes for season two. But it, it's the uh, the trolley problem and the Janet Michael episode are good enough. I really don't care. Those episodes are so good. 
um, yeah. well, particularly the Charlie season problem. Season three is is what you're struggling with is when they go back to Earth. That happens in season three. Yeah, yeah right. Because at the isn't it at the end? The end of season two is where they get put back, and then she goes and finds Chidi. Right at the very end of that, she says, "I think yeah. you're supposed to help me." Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But like when they go to when they go to the bad place, like that episode, it's it's funny, but I don't I don't need it. it it's it. Yeah. That's what I mean. Some of that stuff started to drag for me a little bit. Never to the point where I'm I would necessarily skip it. But I think part of it is because season one and season four are so good mm-hmm. that it, it sort of makes the middle kind of like all right, let's let's get to that. Um, but again, it's not, I'm not saying it's bad. I wouldn't. I would never say anything. And nothing in this is bad. The writing is good all the way through, and there are great little moments there, like the the medium place. Medium place is season two, right? Or is that season one? No, it's season the medium one. Place? They it they meet okay. Mindy in season one, yeah. Okay. And she remember. is recurring, but yeah, she she's there season one. Okay. Oh yeah, because don't they don't they dump Derek off on her in season two? After Janet and him. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 So season two is essentially then they're, they're trying to figure out how to make it work with the, to, to pull off. What? Okay. Now remind me, cause see, I forgot this too. So what, what was the plan with Michael was just to fool him for long enough. And what was the end plan for that? What were they going to do if, if as working well, together, what so was the he, idea just to delay so, him? So he basically told them that he was going to get them into the good place. And then um, he realized he was just kind of like lying to them because he realized there's no way to do that. Like he doesn't know how to do that. Right, and so then, then that's he said, why maybe they they'll take to me to too. Place. Yeah, they have All to go right. to the bad place to get the pins to be able to go through the portal to go talk yeah. to the judge because they wanted yeah. to talk to the judge to try to, you know, say like, hey, we've improved. We don't we don't deserve to go to the bad place. So that's why they had to go to the bad place so they could get the pins to go through the portal to go to the judge's chambers. Yeah, so there is basically a point where Michael starts to realize that maybe the system of points and how things are being done, that there's that something is is wrong about it, uh, and that's when they then go to the judge, and the and because what's the when they get there, she gives them the test, right? So each of them gets a test. No, no, no. not yet. That, see, that see this is what I mean. Different. Season two yeah. and three just blend together yeah. to me. Yeah. Okay, so explain season no, two. I'm going to let you do because I think you're going to be better at this than me. So I'll let you do season two and season three. I'll let you explain those. Well, you already did season two. Season two was them teaming up with Michael and um, basically getting the end of season two is them going to the judge and making their case. So they are put back on. They were basically um, saved from every every instance to where they died, Michael went back and saved them. So they were able to become better. Season three is basically seeing them on earth. If they hadn't died, um, having a near death experience, you know, maybe that will make them, they'll learn how to be better people. Basically it's giving them a chance to be better people if they hadn't died. Um, and then, Things aren't going right. So Michael keeps going down to earth to kind of intervene and interfere, even though he's not supposed to. Um, And then. um, And that's because he realizes that Eleanor and Chidi have to. They have to meet, right? That's the whole sense. Yeah. Like at some point he he realized he, the four of them need to be together to, to make themselves better. And then season three, okay, so they go back, and then in season three is when Michael realizes the point system is off, right? That is season three. Yes. Okay. Because they go and they go and um, find Doug Doug Forsett, who in the very beginning he's like they have this picture. Michael has this picture of his dude, this dude on the wall, 
that he says when Eleanor, you know, he says, oh, you're in the good place. And she says, okay, well, which religion got it right? And he says, you know, oh, every religion got about 5%, you know, Buddhists, you know, Hindu, you know, got about 5%. They're like, but this guy, he did, this Canadian dude did a whole bunch of mushrooms and then he laid out like 95% of what happens when you die, that it's a whole point system. And um, like, that's why his picture's on the wall because he, he knows, you know? And so they go and they find him and they realize that it has completely ruined his life because he's so caught up on what will get him points and what will do good that he's not living a life. Like he's, he's, he's miserable. He, there's this little jerky asshole neighbor kid that like just terrorizes him and beats him up. And then he, doesn't eat anything but radishes because they have like a um, the least amount of like negative effect on the environment. So so trying to live this way isn't good. And they realize that like, whoa, wait a minute. And then um, what they end up, well, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but they end up going to the good place and they, um, in like the mail room. And so they, they find his points and his points aren't even good um, enough to get in the good place. And then they realize that there were um, nobody has gotten in, in what, like 500 years or something yeah, like that something because, like that, yeah. because life and earth has gotten so, so complicated that the old point system doesn't work. And this isn't the good way to judge people. I know I, I skipped ahead a little bit. Um, but, um, and in that one, probably one of my favorite one is when they all, they die. So they go into Janet's void and they all look like Janet. And I just have to like praise um, the actress who plays Janet, Darcy Carden, because it's her but she's acting like everybody else. And that is probably one of my favorite episodes because she, she freaking nails it. It is so funny how she does that. And like, she basically takes on and she like, when I listened to the podcast, like she basically listened to that, that her, her, um, the other actors like she listened to their voices and their mannerisms like she would be driving around there was a story she told her where she was driving around in hollywood and she saw the actor who plays chidi and she was actually listening to like a tape of his voice <laughs> like as she as he was walking down the street so like she did such a good job i, I mean they all did and they're all just amazing but like that that episode is probably one of my favorites just because it's hilarious. Yeah, that is a very good episode. Yeah, that is probably <laughs> one of the funnier ones. So then at the end of season three, they essentially get back to the judge again, which is another kind of becomes a running gag that they just won't leave the judge alone. They keep making, you know, these arguments to her and, you know, she kind of gets sort of sick of them yet likes them. And they make this argument that what they need to do is uh, prove that it isn't there's nothing special about them that they aren't a fluke. And so the idea is that there will be four new humans who have died and they will be put into a reconstructed neighborhood, which is basically the same one as the, as from the first season. And that mm -hmm. these four people will be chosen by the bad place, but they will be then helped or guided or whatever you want to say by the good place people. And so that then sets up season four where these four new people come in one of them is very quickly revealed to be a demon, uh, which is the workout demon, which is one of the funnier gags of the whole show where there's a guy, <laughs> one of the demons. Essentially, when Michael does the reboot, his idea is to keep Eleanor and Chidi from finding each other. And one of the ways he does this is Chidi and Eleanor were set up as soulmates in season one. And so he decides to replace Chidi as a soulmate with this 
huge buff guy who's doesn't he doesn't he work in the mail service too? Is that who was I was gonna say he was a mailman, which that was like her Eleanor has a kink for mailmen. Yeah. So uh, and basically (laughs) every time she starts to ask questions about what's going on, he tears his shirt off and says, You know what? Uh, I'll get back to you and I gotta go to the gym and he keeps saying it. And there's a point where Michael has the his kind of main demons in a room and the guy says something about going to the gym and he says, wait a minute, how often are you telling her you're going to the gym? And he's like, I don't know, six or seven times. And he says, why? And he says, cause you told me to say, if she started asking questions, say I'm going to the gym. He's like, that's not the only thing you're supposed to say. <laughs> and so it's, it's this ridiculous thing where then he keeps tearing his shirt off. In fact, in that he gets angry at Michael and tears his shirt off and says, I'm going to the gym and storms out. Exactly. And so that's the demon that in the fourth season is revealed to be this very boring woman when she starts punching everybody out and tears the skin off. And then it's the guy underneath with no shirt on. And so they have these four humans and they are uh, one of them is Chidi's ex, which then causes them to have to erase Chidi's memory because he won't be able to focus on because the whole idea was he was going to teach them ethics just like he did with the first people. But this was his ex from Earth. And so he says, I'm not going to be able to focus on what I'm supposed to be doing and I'll ruin the whole thing. And so they have to erase his memory, including memories of him and Eleanor falling in love at at least a few times, I think, but at least one major time. And then he's reset. So he's essentially basically he becomes the fourth human when they throw the gym guy out. And so it's him, uh, his ex Simone, who is a brain neurologist or neuroscientist who doesn't believe any of it's real. A gossip columnist named John. Is John his name? John. John? Yeah. 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 And then yeah. Brent, who is the basically complete essence of toxic white male masculinity, the worst person you could possibly be hoped outside of a serial killer, the worst person you'd ever want to hang out with for a long amount of time. Completely self absorbed, right. sexist, racist. Well, I don't think they ever make him homophobic, but you just assume that he's probably afraid of gay people too, because why not? He hates everything else. And he very quickly becomes the biggest challenge of the group. Everybody else, they start to kind of figure out, I mean, Chidi and Simone that were essentially good people anyway. So that's not all that difficult. You never really have any doubt about them, but John and Brent, but even John, they get past him pretty quick, but Brent is the problem. And they basically like, so the bad place got to choose the subjects and they basically chose them to torture the, the four, you know, the, the original group, like, you know, John, John wrote all this terrible stuff about Tahani. So that was like to torture her. Simone was to meant to torture Chidi because that was his ex-girlfriend. And then, you know, so it's just, yeah, it's, um, Jason doesn't get they somebody. Did that Jason has nobody no. torturing him. He's the only one who escapes right. without any anybody torturing him. And it's probably because he's too doofy to even realize if somebody is to. Well, actually, no, right. they do give him that the guy in the second season. The he's reboot. paired with a because yeah. when Jason shows up, I don't think we explained this necessarily all the way out. He's he's told he's a silent monk. And so he keeps his mouth shut to avoid giving away that he's not supposed to be there by playing this silent monk who says nothing, it drives the honey crazy. And then he is paired with an actual, well, what, what is supposed to be an actual silent monk who never leaves his side and drives him crazy. But then once right. they get to the final season where the new humans come in, there really is nobody that is there to torture Jason. Everybody else has somebody who's almost a direct torture. And in fact, Brent is torturing not only them, but the other humans as well. So yes. Brent is kind of the catch-all, worst of all types that you get. So and, gross. Uh, yeah, he's really bad. And that forms the the middle is a lot of Brent jokes and how awful Brent is. And there are different attempts to see if they can figure out some way to get him to move even a little bit I- into being a better person. And, and only at the very last minute do they even get that. And yeah. so that experiment right. then ends... And they are uh, basically they present their case to the judge once again. And the judge basically says, "Okay, you're right. Um, This system doesn't work. And so we're not going to use it anymore. So I'm just going to erase all of existence and we'll restart people. 
so they essentially win their their case and then are told that everything is going to be destroyed at which point they summon Timothy Oliphant to distract the judge, which is one of the <laughs> most brilliant cameo guest stars there is. Uh, where, I mean, he shows up in everything. He shows up in The Mandalorian. He shows up in this. He's everywhere. Uh, but the judge has a thing for him from watching Justified, and so that delays her destroying the universe long enough for them to explain that they are going to create a... Uh, not create a, but that um, that they'll create a new series of tests that allows everybody to keep running the tests until they get better. And it, and so essentially, you would assume that everybody outside of maybe Hitler will eventually get to the good place. That's how it's kind of set up that everybody gets to run through these tests over and over and over until they actually start to. So I guess in theory, even Hitler would eventually realize that, yeah, I maybe shouldn't have murdered six million people. You'd hope. But that's essentially everybody gets to rerun the test as opposed as opposed to just dying with a point system. And that's the decision is you go through and you have this vague memory, which is essentially your conscience or the little voice in the back of your head that tells you whether to do something right or wrong. And then you get to the good place. And so once they establish that system, the four of them are then granted access to the actual good place, which they then find out is not so great. So they get there. And everybody is essentially a zombie, like a, a yep. completely over pleasure centered zombie where they're just in paradise forever. And it ends up ruining you because when you have eternity and there's no end to the fun times, you just kind of vegetate. And so then the idea is, OK, we're going to add an exit to the good place where once you're sick of being in paradise, then you walk through this portal and you finally actually end existence in the universe. They don't really necessarily say what's going to happen, but their existence ends somewhat, depending on how you look at it. And the then wave that's, returns to the ocean. Yeah. Which <laughs> is one of the places that I have a major problem with this show. And this is probably just because this is me. So essentially the four of them are there. And uh, Jason and Janet, who got married way back in season one, are together again. Uh, Tahani is in her mansion and hanging out with her sister and her parents, who are now much better people. That's one of the best things is when Tahani's parents show up, her and her sister Camille uh, see them <laughs> and they apologize. And they're much better because they've realized they were terrible parents. Yes. And then Eleanor and Chidi are, are together. And so then the end of the series is essentially at what point are each of them going to... I don't know, commit go suicide, whatever door. it is, go through yeah, the portal. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, Jason goes first sort of, but then doesn't, but then does. Uh, and then it is, uh, Chidi is next. Well, no, Tahani, Tahani realizes she's ready to leave, but she, Oh, right. But she doesn't, she doesn't becomes go through the portal. An architect. Yeah. yeah. So she, she want because she had this list of everything she wanted to do. Um, and the show is so thoughtful in the things that they do. So like she, she has this huge list of, you know, become a master carpenter, be all this. So, so you see her working with Nick Offerman and he's, you know, looking at this chair that she made and um, going through it and critiquing it. He's like, Oh, I have nothing more to teach you. And it's just like, they, they, they are so thoughtful in everything that they do and every little snippet that, um, it just like I, I love that he was the the master carpenter, you know, that that was her teacher. Like, such a beautiful touch. I think so. She decides like, oh, I I have this big list. I'm ready to go. I don't want to be here anymore, but I want to do something else. So she is going to learn how to be an architect to um to design the tests for for people in the afterlife. So she's not necessarily she doesn't go through the portal, but she's not in the neighborhood anymore. She's not in heaven anymore, I guess you could say. Right. And then it's down to Eleanor and Chidi. And there's a point where Chidi says, okay, I'm ready to leave. And Eleanor tries to get him to stay and then realizes that it's, that's ethically terrible to make him stay because he doesn't want to. And I gotta be honest, this is the part where the show kind of, I, I, it loses me a bit because if I'm Chidi, I would, if it was you and me, I don't care how content I felt. 
I would never leave you to be miserable without me. I, I yeah. that would be worse than being bored in paradise. That Thanks, I just, it, honey. you're welcome. But that's, insane. that's the one part <laughs> of the show where I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me. I'm sorry. It doesn't because he has to know how miserable she's going to be and how alone she's going to feel. And the other thing is, and what, this is what makes it worse to me is I think she leaves what I think they said three Baramis later, which yeah. is not in the, in the scope. Baramis is how they measure time in, in, in the afterlife. It's a relatively short amount of Baramis compared to some of the other lengths. So if he had just stuck it out a little longer, then she would have been ready at the same time. That's the, that's the one thing where I'm like, I'm like, Chidi would not well, have done that. He would not have done it to me. I, I, I have a real hard time with him being okay leaving her there based on how he's been the whole show. I mean, I get why. I understand yeah. the show has to do it's that a show exactly. yeah, and, it has and they to, have and, to and show her being sad and all the rest of it. I get it. But, <sighs> and him leaving though, him leaving gave her the opportunity to realize because she was fine with just, you know, hanging out with him. But then she kind of realized what else she needed to do to be okay. Like at first she thought it was, she needed to help Mindy. And then she realized like, Oh, we're going to make, you know, I want to, um, she goes to the judge and um, has her make Michael an actual human because Michael wants to go because he, he feels like he has like the, the tests, they, they dissolve the group of um, the, um, I guess the people who were like kind of oversaw like how they were going, but it, the, the system was working the good place so well. Council or something they call them. Something. So yeah. yeah. So they basically disband that because everything was working great. So you you did it. You fixed it. Good job. And so he felt lost that he didn't really know what to do. And he was like from the very beginning, he was obsessed with humans. Even though he's a demon and he's supposed to hate them. Like in his office, he had all of this human stuff. A, a bowl of paper clips and you know, like all this stuff that is just random crap, but it was special to him. And so Eleanor goes to the judge and says, okay, this is what needs to happen. And you're going to be done with us from now on. We're not going to bug you anymore. And then um, they get to the end is they get to make Michael a human. Um, so I, I think I, I get what you're saying, but that had to happen for the show because it had to, you know, it had to end to where she needed to kind of be on her own to realize like, okay, this, this is what I need to do. And now I'm at peace and, you know, I, I, I get it, but I just, I think it just had to happen. It bothers me. I know. One I of the few things that bothers me. I think the yeah. thing with Michael is the perfect ending. That is the yes. perfect ending. Well, I mean, that was. But if that didn't, if Chidi didn't leave, then you're just going to have him and Eleanor just hanging out forever. They're never going to want to leave, you know. So he had well, to. Or, or this is how I would have written it: is that they get to a point of peace at the same time because they were true soulmates and their souls were linked, and so the yeah. two of them wake up one morning and look out at the sunrise on their balcony, and look at each other. And don't say anything and then go and tell the group and then they leave. They do all the stuff, you know, the stuff with yeah. Michael and other, you know, they can do all that stuff. Yeah. But sure. it that that is the one thing about the show that I feel like is incorrectly done. Because it yeah. Eleanor leaving first would have made more sense. And I get why Eleanor is the main character. That's why she has to do all the stuff. But Chidi leaving, knowing what will it will do to her, especially because it already happened to her once when his mind got erased. That makes it even yeah. worse. So yeah. that's where if I'm Chidi and I know the pain she already went through, I eat shit until she's ready to go. Because guess what? She already lost me once. Why yeah. would I willingly do that to her again? That's yeah. just me, though. I'm projecting. That's what I would do. Because guess what? No matter what, it's still fucking paradise. And you shut right. the fuck up until the two of you are ready to go together. However, that's just my view of the world where I'm like, nope, I'm not going to saddle somebody with pain if I can avoid it. 
So my well, only real issue is that back to kind of circles back to what her her life and what she'd been through because I mean we, we didn't really touch on it but her you you said her parents were just scumbags but basically her in the flashbacks we get she was on her own and she didn't want any connection at all like she I think she was emancipated by from her parents when she was like 14 she lived on her own if people from work wanted to go to the movies okay yeah I'll meet you there like I I don't want to I'm not going to be responsible for your ticket and I'm not going to oh but you want to buy my ticket well then you're going to get the points on your credit card so she ends up sitting away from everybody like she's she was so closed off and so like just on her own for so long that maybe she had to to be alone to like you know realize I don't know I, I, I get what you're saying. Well, but, but then she like, has that you know, breakdown when they're sitting there and she says, I was alone forever and I thought that's what yeah. I wanted, but it's not. Chidi would yeah. have already known that. Chidi would yeah. know that that was, and, and all right, now I'm putting myself in a writer's position. I'm not a writer. I don't run shows. I don't know shit. So let's just establish it up front. Like I say, every time I come up with one of these ideas, if I'm writing it, they're, they're sitting there, they wake up, they look at each other, they realize, and she says, you know, I, I'm, I'm, or something about, you know, I don't, you know, I'm ready when you are. And he's like, oh, I've been ready for, I don't know, however many bear minutes. And she says, well, then why didn't you leave? And he says, because you spent most of your life alone and I wasn't going to be another person who left you alone in your life. That's the line. And then they walk through yeah. together. That's how you do it, everybody. Because that's what <laughs> Chidi would have done. I'm sorry. I'm pretending I know more than the person who created the show. But in this case, I think I know more than the person who created the show. You fucked up Chidi. I'm sorry. He wouldn't have done that. You, I don't like it. Whatever. Yeah. I don't care that much because I understand the mechanics of a show and it does set up the things come after. And at least that wasn't the last thing that happened. I think it would bother me more if that was the end of the show. The fact that right. then they set up Michael and he goes down and then when Eleanor goes through the portal she becomes the voice in the back of the head of the guy who's going to throw out Michael's spam mail and throws it out. Her spirit, Tinkerbell, star, dust, lands on his shoulder. He takes the mail out and goes and gives it to Michael, who's thrilled because anything human is thrilling to Michael. Therefore, even getting spam mail that is garbage to most people is delightful to him. And that's how the show ends. It's a great ending. Yeah. So, well, because in the very beginning, he said like he wants a he wants a membership card to something or like a rewards card, yeah. and then that's what that's what he's always one punch there. away from finishing yeah. or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's why I don't care that much because that was that was the correct ending for the show. But it's yeah. never not going to bother me that Chidi left. I just I yeah. I have such a problem with that because of all the stuff they went through and the fact that she got erased or that he got erased the first time and then he has to know that she saw him every day and had to pretend not to know him as he started to get involved with Simone again so it's all this shit where it's like Chidi come on man you're not gonna bail you're yeah. not gonna do this to this person who suffered you know all this shit you're not gonna do that like I said I'm getting hung up on one thing <laughs> I honestly don't care though because the, the final season is excellent so yeah. it doesn't matter um, but the fact that it bothers me tells you it's a good show. If it's a shit show, I don't care. Do whatever you want. Cause yeah, I don't care. True. The fact that I like the show is why it bothers me. Yeah, um, that's true. But it's, it, but it has one of the, but again, they clearly knew what the ending of the show was going to be. It was set up right from the beginning. All that stuff is seated. Like the thing about being human and getting the spam card, all that finishes out in the end. And you know, they don't, actually tell you even though they say going through the portal ends your existence i don't know that that's really true because they do become little sparky things that then make people seem to be better so you never know which is fine i don't i don't need that answer so i like the fact that even like oh you end your existence in the universe yeah maybe or you become the voice in the back of the head for somebody else which is you know also a beautiful wonderful thing so right. It's a great show. 
like I said, even even though, like I said, the the middle kind of dragged for me at parts this time, it doesn't matter because the first season and the last season are so good that honestly, that's the important part of a show. If you start really well and you end really well, it really doesn't matter what goes on in the middle, you know? Right. I love Frasier too, and it had a season or two that I'm like, eh, yeah, eh, eh. sure, yeah. So, um, anything else you'd like to say about the show? Um, no, I just you know, and every 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 time we watch it, like like you said, it, I know I like it more than you do, but just like I said, the writing and the details. So like they, there was a point to where they were talking about um, the show Friends. And then Michael says something of like, oh, well, oh, they're not, they wouldn't get into, they wouldn't get into heaven. Or first, I think he says, well, they would get into heaven. And then he singles all of them out and was like, oh, no, oh, no, they wouldn't get in. They wouldn't get in. But Phoebe, of course, Phoebe would get in. So then when they finally do go to heaven, they have this, um, what, a Greek philosopher that was there. Uh, what was her name? Hy- Hypatia. Hypatia of Athens or whatever. Or there Athena you go. Or whatever. So, so who plays her? Freaking Lisa Kudrow, Phoebe from Friends. Like, so I, you know, yes, I recognized her, but then I, this time I, I caught that he said like Phoebe would be in heaven and sure enough, there's Phoebe in heaven. So it's like the, the layers of this show and the writing are, is so good. I just, I don't know. I, I really, I really love this show. I think it's forking fantastic. I, I, and I have to say too, I agree with the writing because the, the ethical stuff, which I find really interesting. That's the most interesting stuff in the show for me is the, all the philosophical ideas and you know, the, all the different, people i mean there's a couple of books that are mentioned which i'm going to read i've got them written down i want to read some of these books that that i meant i meant to do it the last time we watched it and i forgot to this time uh-huh. i actually was taking notes on the books that Chidi's bringing up because i want to read them uh, i'm actually yeah, sure. interested in in a lot of that stuff um and yeah. it's and like the trolley problem which is something i was very familiar with and it's one of the classics of philosophy and ethics is that episode is so great where, you know, there, and it, and it is the actual philosophical idea. So it's, it's presented in a way that's entertaining and funny when they keep running people over. And it's basically like a gore film where just blood and bits are getting showered <laughs> all over them. Yeah. But it's in service of an actual ethical idea, which is, well, what do you do? What, what, how do ethics change when you don't know people? Do you still save them? When you do know people, right. do you save them? When do you yeah. do harm or not? That type of thing. Uh, right. There's a lot of that in here that I think otherwise most people probably would have no exposure to or no interest in because yeah, if you read, I mean, I may read these books and fall asleep. I mean, it's ethics is not the most exciting topic in the world. You know, they, they don't make movies with Tom Hanks storming the beach of the ethics country to, to rescue moral philosophers. You know, that's what you do with more exciting material like world wars. So it is not necessarily stuff that you would think you could make a whole entertaining comedy around. And yet this show did. So yes. any complaints I have are honestly can go fuck themselves because you don't see this type of show very often. So who cares if I found a couple of episodes of season two to be slow? It's a show about morality and ethics. That's genuinely funny and actually teaches people something. And that something is maybe you should be nice to other people. Exactly. So who gives and a shit if in, I'm not, the, you know, and they mix in funny, you know, like funny, stupid shit and fart jokes. And, you know, like, so it's not like, like it doesn't feel heavy. Yes. You're learning about ethics, but then it doesn't beat you over the head with it. And it's also funny and you laugh yes. and yeah. And this show does it to me. Um, like Shit's Creek did where I could there were a few mo- moments where I am in tears bawling and then I start to laugh like laugh like a ma- like I feel like a fucking maniac when I watch this show because I'm like all the emotions like crying and laughing within a couple seconds of each other but it's great a show that has a bad Janet that constantly farts as the answer to many questions. 
<laughs> and as kind of a, a, you know, we didn't even get into the idea of the, the bad no. Janet thing. Oh, there's lo- there's, it. there's a ton of really neat stuff from this that is, like I said, my criticisms are nothing because I would still watch this over nearly anything else. I mean, this is this is such a smart show that most people should watch it. Yeah. And again, I'm I'm still astonished that this show could be this smart and this good at the same time. Yep. You don't see it for the same way that we talk about when we talked about Shit's Creek, the idea of how uh, equality and tolerance are baked in and you don't think about them, but they are always there in the way that people right. react to each other. It's the same thing here where the ethics and morality stuff, even when they're not necessarily showing you a chalkboard where Chidi is pointing out the philosophy of it, it's still all there. This entire thing is about the idea of how we interact with each other and, and who is what, what worth is and what actual worth is and how, you know, trying to judge somebody by one or two actions is a bad idea that it doesn't tell you the totality. I mean, the whole thing with Brent that gets wrapped up and it's one of the great things in the show that the show is pointing out is Brent is terrible and terrible and terrible. And then at the very moment where the experiment is going to end, he finally cracks and starts to apologize to Chidi and then everything freezes because the experiment ends. And so mm-hmm. when they look at all the points of the four people, everybody improved but him. He was still in the negative. And Sean, who's the, the bad place manager, says, well, there you go. He didn't improve. So they lose. And Michael's point is he did improve. He may not have gone into the positives, but at the end he went from negative 50 whatever percent in point totals to minus one. And that's because yep. you can't judge somebody by all their decisions up to now because the next day they could become a better person. And that's the point. Stuff like that is not stuff you see very often. And the show right. does it better than, I mean, I, I've never even seen another show that gets into ethics like this. There probably are some, but I doubt they're anywhere near at this level. Right. So just for that reason, it should be seen by everybody. I mean, th- this is unlike Parks, which struggled with its ratings and is a great show. This show, right from the beginning, I think was recognized as great. I mean, I remember the reviews were always really good. The ratings were good. So this one at least has been properly recognized for being what it is. Unlike a lot of shows that you end up finding out, oh, these were actually really smart shows and nobody ever saw them unless they aired them in other countries where they have more respect for good material because we're in the United States. We're all dummies. But everywhere else, they kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, you can have intelligent stuff and people will watch it. Here we're like, no. Uh. So I'm happy it's it's looked at the way it is. And if anybody hasn't seen it, yeah. we've now spoiled it for you. But honestly, Sorry. we really haven't because it doesn't matter. We've watched it now, what, five times, six times? Something like that. Yeah, maybe. Maybe five. Yeah. Yeah. It never isn't good. It's never not funny. It doesn't matter when you know, because then actually this is, this is a show where, where knowing might actually be better because then you get to really look at all the things that are going on. You get to notice all the little details. Like this time I was paying attention to all the word play in the background, all the, the gags on names, you know, beignet in the jets and stuff like that. Yes. Yes. There, I noticed a lot uh, more of that. Joni you know, and the Joni and the tchotchkes. Sushi with, with and the banshees. Sean is there. Yes. Yeah. You know, oh yeah. And, there, and there's so much of that stuff. Yeah. So much of that. And, well, and I know, a lot of, yeah. I know the writers, that was one of their big things was they like, and some of this was in parks because some of the same people yes. were involved is this yes. idea that they like to do puns. They like to have funny yeah. word things. So that's all over the right. place. And a lot of the, the characters too, like there's a, a running gag with there's a, a bad place employee, Glenn, where everybody is so mean to him. And it's always just like, he doesn't even need to say anything. And it's shut up, Glenn. That's one of the main writers on the show. The yeah. voice, Joe Mandy, who's one of the writers is the voice of the lava monster, Todd. So they pull in a lot of these people that aren't really actors. And um, one more thing I wanted to say about, um, I was going to mention this. Um, I think on the second episode, uh, Mark Evan Jackson who plays Sean, um, he had mentioned that he on Brooklyn nine, nine, he, um, he was on that show, but he auditioned for 
I, I don't know who, cause I've never seen that show. So I didn't, I wasn't familiar with the character he said, um, but he said that his agent got this email from Mike Schur that because Mark Evan Jackson, if you're not familiar with him, he's very like, he even calls himself like C-3PO, you know, he's very like, he sounds like a robot and he's just very, you know, so he wasn't right for that role. I'd but, like to know why this guy looks like Beaker. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> exactly. That guy from Parks. The lawyer from Parks is Mark Evan Jackson. Exactly. Um, so Mike sure took the time to write an email to his agent and say, hey, you know what? We couldn't have asked him to do any better. We couldn't have asked for anything more. It's just not the direction that we wanted to go. Like the, He's not the idea we had for this character. But like just he did such a good job so uh, the fact that he takes the time to do stuff like that because when in this industry w would i don't think that's very common for somebody to do that um but then they also said that um and with one of the writers um in the episodes they have like basically this folder so like the um the actress that plays Vicky um, or the real Eleanor, which we didn't even get into uh, another way to torture them. Um, she originally auditioned for Tahani. And so she wasn't what they were looking for, but they basically put her in this folder. I think it's called like good for something or so. So it's, so it's not necessarily the role you auditioned for, but we're going to use you for something. And, you know, and it's like the fact that they just don't give up on people and they remember people and um, they have the same kind of thing with like jokes, whereas, uh, you know, like, oh, we we had to cut this joke because of time or maybe it didn't fit or whatever. They put it in something they call the candy bag and maybe they'll revisit it, you know, and it's just like it's so thoughtful and so everything is just so thought out that it's just yeah I, I really appreciate the show and I, I think it's I think it's great well I don't know that there's much else to say go watch it I mean basically go this has it. been an hour and 12 minutes of you should go watch it so go watch it <laughs> go watch it and that's it that's all we have to say is it's really good so Sam thanks for coming on and doing this I knew that that this was going to be a fun one because I, I know that you've been listening to the show and you love the show or love the podcast. Sorry, not the show. And then, yeah. Um, yeah. So. Thank yeah. You and if you, if you are a fan of that show, I, I definitely recommend listening to that podcast because they, with the show, you know, like as much as I like the show, they did a really good job with the podcast as well. And I, I, I am a fan of finding out the little, like, you know, the, the behind the scene thing. And so if you, if you like that stuff as well, you should definitely listen to it. Cause there's a lot of behind the scenes. And I really like that. They talk to a lot of different people, a lot of different aspects. And that's another thing that they, you know, that I think this show, they appreciate everybody, everybody who was involved, they couldn't have done it, you know? So they talk to the costume designer. They cost, they talk to all of these different things because there's so many different layers of what goes into the show. And um, yeah, if you're interested in the little you know, Easter eggs and details that you don't really know about, I would listen to the podcast. Cause they What's it called really again? What's the title? Them. Did you say what the title was? I, I think it's just called the, the um, let me look. It's called like The Good Place. Um, the Good Place, the podcast. Okay. Is what it's Got called. It. And it's like, you know, it has the NBC logo on it. Like, you know, they, at every time they curse in the podcast, they dub over with Kristen Bell saying either fork or shirt, which is fucking hilarious um, because it's so out of place, but it works. So yeah, it's, it's great. So yeah, go watch it. It's a great show. Um, I only I only wish it was available more broadly than Netflix. So I'm sorry. You'll have to subscribe to Netflix it, or rent it on Amazon. It's probably cheap enough. I mean, it's usually I don't know how seasons are. And so that's the only bad thing is I wish it was it. I don't even think it's on the Peacock app. 
because I was going to say you might be able to check. It might be. I, I wish it was more accessible because I know there are people who are like, well, I'm not paying for Netflix and I don't blame you. I've, I've had enough of paying for 80 streaming services too. So I'm, I, I'm not telling you to subscribe to something and spend more money. However, you could do a free trial, watch it and then cancel. That's always an option. <laughs> I'm not saying that's ethically something you should do. Cheney might have a problem with it, but I don't because they're making plenty of money from other people. So yeah, it's on Netflix. Check the Peacock app in case it's on there. Uh, otherwise you could rent it from all day where, and I think for almost anybody, it would be worth a rental because it really is that good a show, especially if you like stuff like Shit's Creek parks and rec, that type of show, you're pretty much a baked in audience for something like this. And uh, again, it's, not often you see a really well done, complete beginning to end comedy that is genuinely funny and is centered around the idea of ethics, morality, and how people treat each other. So just for that reason, you should watch it. But also, it's a really funny show. So Sam, thanks for doing this. Thank you. And for everybody else, we'll talk to you next week. Lando should be back. Or not. If not, maybe we'll be reviewing another show. Who the fuck knows? <laughs> Have a nice weekend. Bye. Visit OzoneNightmare.com to subscribe to new episodes, browse through our back catalog, or to find links to support the show. Follow at OzoneNightmare on Twitter for the latest episode postings and other show information. If 280 characters just isn't enough, you can always email us, theOzoneNightmare at gmail.com. The opening theme for the show is provided by Heartbeat Hero. The closing theme is provided by Ogre. Please visit and support these artists using the links in the show notes for each episode.